This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Okay, this lecture is on Chapter 9 of the free lecture notes for Paper F9, uh, which is headed up Discounted Cash Flow, Further Aspects. And uh, in this chapter, there are three um, special situations that you could have to deal with in the exam, uh, which all have their own, each of them has like, its own special technique but they are completely separate. There's something called capital rationing, uh, something called replacement, something called lease versus buy. But because they are completely separate, um, we'll have three separate lectures, which would seem logical. And this first one is on capital rationing. And to explain uh, what we mean by that and how we approach it and the terminology related to it, can you turn straight to example one on the second page? Well, look at it with me. It says a company has the following four projects available, A, B, C, D. For each of them, you've got the cash flow. So project A, an outflow of 500, and then an inflow of 221 a year for three years. And here I've calculated the MPVs for you at a cost of capital of 10%. And there we are, A gives an MPV of 50, B 57, C 36, D 50. Now, okay, in the exam, the examiner could, if you wanted, make the question a bit longer by having you calculate the MPVs. But we know how to do that, you know, that's not a capital rationing problem. All it would do would take a bit longer. Uh, my MPVs are correct, so uh, don't go wasting time checking me. However, Suppose I gave you that, the company's got the following four projects available, there's the cash flows, there the MPVs, and suppose there was nothing else, forget all the bit below for a minute, suppose I gave you that and said, what shall we do? What should the company do? Now most people say, oh, we should do project B. Why? Because it gives the highest MPV. Well, no, you're making an assumption which isn't there. If I told you, you can only choose one of those four projects, then fine. You'd choose the one with the highest MPV, which would be B. But I didn't say that. There are simply four projects available. They all give a positive MPV. And so if there was no other information, you would accept all four projects. You'd accept any project which has a positive MPV. Again, I didn't say you had to choose. Four are available. If they're positive, we'll do four. That's fine. Except for the fact that to do all four, how much cash would we need? A would need 500, B would need another 600, C 300, D 400. So to do all four, we need to have capital available of 5, 11, 14, 1,800. If we have enough capital available, we'll do all four. But the problem is, Look at part B. Capital is restricted. For some reason, we've, we'll talk about why it might happen later, but for some reason, we've only got 1,600 available. We can't do all four because there isn't enough cash. That would need 1,800. So capital rationing is when there's a limit on the cash available. Part A, if there is no capital rationing, you will do all four projects. If we can get as much cash as we want, if I can get 1,800, we'll do all four. But our problem is when we come to part B, there's only 1,600 available. Clearly, I hope we can't do all four, so the question is, how am I going to invest the 1,600? 
uh, to get the best total MPV. Um, also, though, look at part B. It says to capitals restricted to 1600. It also says the projects are what we call infinitely divisible. Now, what infinitely divisible means, which as I go through, I think you'd agree, is normally a bit impractical, but it happens in the exam. Infinitely divisible means we can do any fraction of a project. Uh, for example, we could do 50% of A. Uh, we could do half of A, we could do 10% of A, 80% of A. We're allowed to do any fraction of a project. It also means that if we do do, for example, 50% of A, we assume it means exactly 50% of the uh, outflow is needed. We assume we'll get exactly 50% of the inflows and therefore, we'd get 50% of the MPV. So again, what I mean is, for example, if we do 10% of a project, remember we can do any fraction. If we do do, for example, 10%, um, it'll be 10% of all the cash flows And therefore, 10% of the MPV. Ten percent was an example, obviously. You know, if you do 60%, we'll get 60% of the cash flows and 60% of the MPV. Which again, I don't think is in most cases terribly practical. You know, even if you can do half a project, I think it would be unusual to expect to get exactly half the returns. And finally, with infinite divisible, although we can do any fraction of a project, we cannot do more. Than 100% of each project. So I can do half of A if I want but we can't do two A's. The maximum we can do of A is one, 100%. So there's a situation in B. The question is again, how are we going to invest the 1,600 available so as to get the highest possible MPV? And it's no good just saying, oh, B's, look at B. It gives us 57, that must be the best. The trouble is, B needs the biggest outlay of 600. You know, it might be better to um, use our money choosing C. C only needs half the outlay, and it gives more than half the return. And so the approach we have to take is something that if you've done F5, it's actually similar to key factor analysis, but still, what we do is this. For each project, we know how much is needed at time zero. The capital at time zero. A needs 500, B needs 600, 300 and 400. We know the MPV that will be generated from each. 50, 57, 36 and 50. And because they're divisible, we then calculate what MPV would be generated for every dollar invested. The net present value per dollar invested. A gives us 50 MPV for an outlay of 500. 
Well, the MPV for every dollar invested is 50 divided by 500. 10 cents, point one. So for every dollar we put in A, we get 10 cents. What about B? We get 57 for an outlay of 600. The dollar is 0 0.095, nine and a half cents. For C, 36 from an outlay of 300 is 12 cents. And finally, D, 50 from an outlay of 400. The net present value per dollar invested, 12 and a half cents. We want to invest our money in whichever way gives the biggest NPV. And so the best one to go for would be D, and we'll get 12 and a half cents per dollar. Second best would be C at 12 cents per dollar. Third best A at 10 cents per dollar. And fourth best would be B. Now we can go through and decide how we're going to invest. The best one is Project D, so we'll invest as much as we can in D. But remember, the most we can invest is 100% of the project. So the most we can invest in D is 400. Now remember, with 1,600 available, we'll invest 400 in D. There's 1,200 remaining. Uh, uh, what MPV would be generated? Well, since we're investing in 100% of D, we'll get 100% of the MPV. The MPV will be 50. I've still got 1,200 left. We can't invest more in D, maximum 100%. So we'll go to the one that's next best, which is C. How much does C need? 300, so I can do all of C. We'll invest 300, and because we're doing all of C, the MPV will be 36. How much left? We've still 900 left. Can't invest in more of C, so go to the next best, which is A. A needs 500, so we can afford to do all of A, 100%. And since we're doing all of A, we'll get 100% of the MPV, which is 50. We've still 400 left. And so, of course, we can't invest more in A. It'll have to go into the last one, B. And here, of course, we can't do all of B. We'll invest 400. To do all of B would require 600. So what, we're doing four-sixths or two-thirds of B. And how much MPV will we generate? Well, B gives us nine and a half cents per dollar. And so the MPV we'll get from B is 38. Or if you prefer, since we're investing in four-sixths or two-thirds of B, we'll get four-sixths or two-thirds of the MPV, which again is 38. So there's how we'll invest. And as a result, what is the maximum MPV? 50, 36, 50, 38. 174, there is the maximum MPV. So I don't know, I think that's a straightforward exercise. As I've already said, um, the question could be that bit longer by having you do the MPVs first. But otherwise, MPV per dollar invested, uh, and off we go.
Uh, one tiny bit of terminology, I don't actually like this word, but the MPV per dollar invested is also referred to as the profitability index. So if there is any mention of profitability index in the exam, that's all it means. I don't like it because, of course, with MPVs, we're looking at cash flows, not profits. I actually think it's a dreadful name to give it. Anyway, there we are, except, of course, that was where we had capital rationing and the projects were infinitely divisible. And 174 is the maximum MPV we can achieve. I mean, try any other combination of investing 1600 uh, and the MPV will be lower. However, look at C. Part C, again, we've got capital rationing, 1600 available. We can't do all four in full. But the difference here, the projects are not infinitely divisible. So this time we can't do fractions of a project. Each project, you either do all of it, 100%, or you do none of it. So what are we going to do here? Well, here there is no, what you might call, quick way. All you can do, or the only way we can do it, is to list out the various possibilities. What I mean is, we can't afford to do A, B and C. That would take 1,100, total 1,400. But we obviously can't afford to do D as well, because we haven't got enough money. Alternatively, we could choose to do A, C and D. That would need 500, 800, uh, 1200. But again, we can't do B as well. We can afford, well, only afford to do three of the projects. We can't do all four. So what other possibilities are there? Uh, we could do A, B and D, but not C. We can do B, C, and D, but not A. So there we are. There are uh, uh, four different, what you might call, combinations that we can afford to do. We can only do three of the projects, not all four. And whichever is the best of those is whichever gives the biggest total NPV. So what are the totals? If we do A, B, and C, we have 50 from A, 57 from B, 36 from C. So the total MPV, 50 plus 57 plus 36 is 143. If we do A, C and D, A gives 50, C gives 36, D gives 50, so a total of 136. A, B and D, A 50, B 57, C 36. Uh, oh, sorry, A, B and D, I beg your pardon. A 50, 57, D 50, so a total of 157. And the final possibility, B, C, D, 57, 36, and 50, a total of 143. Now, those are the only four ways we could choose to invest the money. Uh, and whichever is the highest uh, is the best. So, in fact, the best would be 157, and that's how we should invest A, B, and D. Now, two things here. Uh, firstly, some people say, well, I could have spotted that just by looking at it. Mm. Oh, well, if you can, fine. Uh, but the danger is in the middle of an exam, things sometimes look obvious and they're not obvious. For the time it takes, if you are asked this, I would list the possibilities 
you know, we're not perfect when you're rushing in the exam. It's very easy to miss something and with the wrong answer, and it wouldn't even be clear what you were doing. You know, even if I've missed something here, it's obvious what I'm trying to do, and I'd get most of the marks. Secondly, now this worries some people, although A, B and D is the best, how much a capital investment would be required? To do A needs 500, to do B needs 600, to do D needs 400. I think I've got them right. Five, six, four. Yes, a total of um, 1,500. We had 1,600 available. And so people say, well, what are we going to do with the other 100? We can't invest the other 100 in Project C because they're not infinitely divisible. But what's going to happen to the other 100? Now, some people say, oh, put it on deposits and then we can earn interest. Well, fine, yes, but if that was possible, we'd have been told it would effectively have been a fifth investment, but there's no mention of being able to do anything else with our money. So what about the other hundred? Well, the answer is quite simple. One way or another, the 1600 available is being borrowed. We're either actually going to, able, going to go out and borrow 1600 but even if we've got 1600 already in the bank, effectively it's being borrowed from shareholders. It's shareholders' money. And if we're not going to use it, if we've nowhere to invest the money, then we should give it back to the shareholders. So if we haven't got the money and we're going to borrow it, well, there's no point in borrowing 1,600 when you only need 1,500. You only borrow 1,500. I say again, uh, even if the money's in the bank, it's effectively being borrowed from shareholders. It's their money. And so if you don't need it, give it back to shareholders, give them a dividend. So the answer is here, don't borrow the other 100. And some people ask me, is that practical? Of course it is. If I'm, I'm, if it's just that I'm able to borrow 1600, then I think you'd agree, you'd be stupid to borrow 1600 and pay interest if you only need 1500. This business about giving dividends to shareholders, that is true. You know, companies, they don't give all their money to shareholders as dividend normally. Why? Because they use the money to expand the company. But if they can't find any projects to invest in, they shouldn't just sit there with shareholders' money when there's nothing to do with it. If they've nowhere to invest the money, the extra hundred, stop borrowing from the shareholders, give it back to shareholders as dividend. All right, finally, because that's solely arithmetic involved capital rationing. And why are we capital rationing in the first place? You know, why is there a limit on the cash available? Well, there are two reasons it could occur. The most obvious is what we call hard capital rationing. And hard capital rationing is a situation where lenders will not lend us anymore. You know, clearly there's a limit to how much any company is going to be able to borrow. And if the most we can borrow is 1600, fine. That's hard capital rationing. Boom, boom. The other reason, though, is actually more common. It's called soft capital rationing. And what this is, just think about this. If you're working and earning a salary, 
And if you wanted to buy a car, then I'm sure if you're earning a reasonable salary, the bank would lend you money, depending on how much you're earning. And suppose the bank would be prepared to lend you ooh, $20,000. Does that mean you're automatically going to borrow $20,000 and buy the biggest car you can? What you might well say is, oh, the bank will lend me $20,000, but... You know, I'll be having to pay interest on that. I don't want to borrow that much. I'll only borrow 15000 and buy a smaller car. That's what normally happens, you know. I, I can't believe all of you watching this. All go out and borrow as much as you possibly can. You limit yourself. And the same happens with companies. The company might be able to borrow 2000 or something. But they've chosen to limit the amount to 1600 And if that's the reason, it's soft rationing. It's where land we can borrow more. But we have limited the amount we prepared to borrow. So that's clear. It, it doesn't affect the arithmetic at all, you know. The arithmetic's the same, whatever the reason for the limit for the capital rationing. But the examiner on more than one occasion has asked you why capital might be rationing, rationed rather, and he expects you to differentiate, explain the hard, the soft, the two reasons. All right, well, that's the first of the three further aspects, capital rationing. In the next lecture, we'll look at the next one, which is replacement.